going to go to Haggai chapter number two. Haggai, H-A-G-A-I-I. It is one of the minor prophets, amen, and it is uh, found in the latter third section of the Jewish scriptures uh, in our Christian churches. We call it the Old Testament, but it is, amen, uh, oh, thank you, Sister Sheila, amen. It is a passage of scripture that we started our year off preaching from, and I felt so led to revisit it at the halfway point of the year as we celebrate our anniversary, and uh, it is certainly uh, important to remind ourselves that we stand on uh, holy ground, ground that has been uh, stewarded and care- catered, taken care of for decades before we got here. Uh, it's, uh, you know, a truth that this church uh, is an extension of uh, the earliest church that my grandmother started here in 1972. Praise God. 1972, my grandmother moved out here from North Carolina. And uh, as most black women did during that time, they, the, the scholars say they dug out a church, praise God, which means that they helped uh, with prayer and with lots of elbow grease. They started to gather people, and then they called for a preacher, or they found a preacher, often who was a male, because at that time, even about 40, 50 years ago, women weren't in many places uh, allowed or affirmed to be a pastor or to preach or to teach. And so we have, uh, since 2005, when I came to uh, kind of relaunch our church, we appreciate that we live on and stand on the foundation of that ministry. And uh, that was the church that gave birth to my uh, spiritual journey and my walk with God. My parents obviously uh, have been a consistent through line uh, to that. And matter of fact, this is the first Sunday my father's in church since his July 3rd birthday. Praise the Lord. Amen. So we certainly want to celebrate him. Amen. We, you know, I don't know if he wants everybody to know that he's, you know, 70. Seven, praise God. But uh, now they do know. Somebody say amen. <laughs> amen. 77 years of living. Double seven. We won't ask him later about those numbers, how they worked in his life before he became a Christian. Praise God. If those numbers were hitting a lot. I don't know. You got to ask him. Talk to him a little bit afterwards. Um, but it is indeed the case. How many of you know that none of us are here through the power of our own strength? that we are always an extension of God's activity somewhere in the world. And so this passage of scripture uh, is a super clarifying passage in, I think, the way in which I hope our church continues to imagine how we carry out the work of God in our lives, in our families, and in our community. So Haggai chapter number two is where we'll bring our attention to, and we'll read a little bit, and then I'll try to teach and share what the Lord is, has said for us on today. When you have Haggai chapter number two, verse one, you can say, I got it. It should be on the screen, so everybody should have it, all right? On the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah. Everybody say governor of Judah. To Joshua, son of Jezodak, the high priest. Everybody say the high priest. And to the remnant of the people. First observation from this text that's worth noting is that when God speaks, there is always a word for us generally And there's always a word for us specifically where we sit in relationship to systems of power, leadership, and structures. That too often we can assume that God does not have a particular assignment, a particular set of instructions that we ought to attend to. But here in this passage, we see that the prophet is actually speaking God's word to the politicians, 
to the religious leaders and to the remnant, the scripture says, those who are the survivors of great trial, tribulation, and loss. I don't know about you, but I'm glad God speaks to survivors. Amen. God speaks to folk who have made it through something. Anybody here made it through a thing or two in your life? Amen. You ought to pat yourself on the chest and say, God is speaking to me today then. All right. And so the prophet continues to say, ask them, listen to this question, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? The prophet is asking those who are there, who remembers what the temple, the place where God dwells, looked like before we went into bondage? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? But now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Josedak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work. Everybody say work. work. For I am with you. Somebody say God is with me. This is what I covenanted or promised with you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit remains among you. Do not fear. Man, that's some good words all through that, right? Verse number six, this is what the Lord Almighty says in a little while. Somebody say in just a little while. I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations. And what is desired by all nations will come and I will fill this house with glory says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine and the gold is mine. The glory of this present house will be greater, listen, than the glory of the former house. I'm going to say that again. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house. And in this place, I will grant peace. The word of God for us, the people of God, let us say thanks be to God. All right, we'll speak for the next few moments simply from a topic that says your greater shall be later. Your greater shall be later. God bless the word that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide your word in our heart. So we won't sin against you. And as I stand to preach and teach your word, send the anointing that makes it all easy. And may we who are hearers of your word, may it penetrate our most exterior being and get into our heart. So we won't sin against you. In Jesus' name we pray. Let God's people say amen. Come on, tell your neighbor, it's going to get better. Come on, tell them that it's going to get better. Now... It is a powerful expectation for us to assume that the words of Scripture can speak to us across thousands of years of time and still land in a way that plants a seed of hope, healing, and expectation in our lives. If you are not a very literary person, you could read some works of literature and it will land like a great thud. Uh, I've tried to read Shakespeare and I don't see the appeal, praise God. I've gone back further and tried to read Aristotle and Socrates. And like Aristotle, Socrates not so much. It sometimes depends on the reader. But I love how God's word is more than just words on a piece of paper. It is the living, breathing, dynamic ideas of God captured across time so we can constantly benefit from God's revelatory expectation that literally kind of blows on the fire of our hearts and keeps us dynamic and alive. This idea that God has glory, that God wants to unleash 
in our lives is as old of a promise as God has been interacting or have created creation. From the beginning, God has always been unleashing glory. The activity of God, the presence of God, the move of God. God has, from the beginning, allowed these accounts of the earliest of creation to be described as when there was nothing, the breath of God moved across the deep and things became animated. Things began to move. One of our most earliest Christian theological assumptions is that God creates ex nihilo, which means God creates out of nothing. That God's power, God's presence has the ability to take nothing, even a little, and turn it into something everlasting. And it is this work and activity of God that we find animated in the story of the children of Israel as they journey through time, they are constantly trying to figure out, God, how are we to respond to your presence, to your activity? How are we to respond to what you are doing in the world? There was a time in the life of the children of Israel where they were moving around the Middle Eastern, Northern Africa uh, part of the country and or uh, of the world. And, and because they didn't have a place, a land to settle in, they carried what they called was a tabernacle. It was like the church, ex the presence of God that we assume is, is active in every church because they didn't have a singular place to stay. They carried around the tabernacle which held the Holy of Holies. It was the, the Ten Commandments. It was uh, Aaron's uh, rod, which was a, a leadership tool that Aaron used and God turned it into a miracle. They turned or they carried around these artifacts that represented and reminded them of God's activity. And whenever they needed to have a, 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 a spiritual practice or prayer or, or offer these sacrifices, they would depend on the tabernacle to turn whatever place they were in to become sacred. Now, as they continued in their journey, they ended up getting to the promised land. They didn't need a tabernacle because the temple no longer was on the move, the temple would be in a stationary place. And so they gave away or, 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 or phased out the tabernacle and they built a temple and the temple became the center of life for the children of Israel for almost 1,000, 1,500 years or so. When they went into bondage, the temple got destroyed. And so for hundreds of years, there was a, a remnant of people left in Jerusalem while the majority of folks were taken away into bondage. And when God freed them from their bondage in Babylon and under the Persian Empire, they got to go back to their homeland. And this is where the story is being picked up because there are people there who are trying to figure out, God, where can we worship you? Where can we find a sacred place to engage with you? Where can we, we we've read of the stories of, of, of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. We read of the stories of Moses carrying the tabernacle around through the desert. We read of David and Saul and Samuel and John. We read of all these folks. But God, today we need a place that will allow us to have proximity with you. And so they began to build the temple again. But how many know when you start doing a project, you start looking at your project and you realize, man, this is a big project. Anybody ever, uh, you know, try to put a puzzle together and it's a thousand piece puzzle and you look at it from the beginning, oh, this is going to be fun. 
And then you get into it and you're like, oh my goodness. Why did I think this was going to be enjoyable? And, 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 and the further in you get, you start to reach a threshold where you've gone too far to give up. It's like, now nah, I done wasted three days of my life. A third of the puzzle is built, although there are big gaps and I can't figure it out. Anybody ever been too far into a thing that you couldn't quit? So you just said, I'm going to keep pushing forward. But in the pushing forward, you start to get discouraged and you start to rethink, did I hear the instructions? Did I follow the path? Should I turn around <laughs> and just go do something different? I don't know if that's you. That, 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 that's certainly me sometimes. It's like, I, I, I got started on this journey, and now I'm halfway through it, and it's like, Lord, why me? But this is the moment <clears throat> where I see God injecting God's self in our journey to remind us that there is a blessing, as the saints say, in your pressing. <clears throat> there is a gift in you and I staying the course and appreciating that while you and I may not have a tabernacle and certainly we have a church that we could, you know, uh, 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 a scribe is a temple, so to speak. I want you to appreciate that we are the temple of God. We collectively, you in your journey, your life, God is literally working on you. You are God's temple. And God has need of you. God, in all God's omnipresence, does not require a place to dwell. Because God is literally everywhere. So God does not need a physical body, a physical place, a physical building. But God does desire a place to dwell. I want you to think about this. God is omnipresent by character and nature is how we understand God. But God wants to inhabit us. God does not just want to be present around us, but God wants to take up residence within us. As a matter of fact, some could argue that with the creation that we are emanating from God, God has already put a divine footprint as a down payment. So God is present. God wants to grow God's self yes. mm -hmm. in us. God wants to grow God's self in us to the point where whatever is not like God gets pushed out of us. I hope you catch what I'm trying to say today. Amen. That we can begin with God's divine imprint, but life can sometimes take up too much space in us. And so when we follow the ways of Jesus, God begins to work on us. And the divine footprint or thumbprint within us begins to expand where all the junk that life drops in our lives. God says, if you give me time, I will push it out of you. And then the scripture says, and my spirit will remain. I mean, can you be honest and just say, God, there's some things in my life that I need you to push out of me. And I'm not talking about the essence of who you are. I'm not talking about, you know, the, the cultural gifts of who you are. I'm talking about those vices. I'm talking about those sensibilities. I'm talking about those idiosyncrasies. I'm talking about those faux pas. 
Mm -hmm. Those things that you know you wish you did not have. Amen. Amen. I'm not asking you to confess today unless you want to. Praise God. <laughs> but I want you to appreciate that God is wanting to work continuously on us. Why? Because when God works on us, how many of you know then God gives us an assignment to literally steward the world? Amen. Your world, your family, your children, your neighborhood, your vocation. As God works in you, you begin to work in the world. You wonder, God, why is my job so full of haters? Well, have you asked yourself, am I a hater? <laughs> God, why is my house so upside down? Have you asked yourself, God, am I right side up? God, why am I so physically unhealthy? Have you asked yourself, am I taking care of my temple? This is not a self-blame game. It is just me inviting you to think about, could it be that God is trying to work on us? God is trying to make you and I a better version of ourselves. And dare I say here at The Way, God wants The Way to be a place where, listen, the work of God never ceases. Amen. That God works on us so we can then work with each other. So then we can work in the world. This is a quote from St. Teresa of Avila. I love this. You may have heard it before. We're going to read it again. But this is what uh, Teresa of Avila, she is an 11th century mystic. She says it like this. Christ has no body but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which God looks compassion on this world yours are the feet with which God walks to do good yours are the hands with which God blesses all the world yours are the hands yours are the feet yours are the eyes you are God's body Christ has no body now but yours no hands, no feet on earth, but yours. Yours are the eyes with which God looks compassion on this world. Christ has no body now on earth, but yours. I want you to leave this, this up for a second. I just want you to think about what it would look like if we really believed that God can't do anything in the world except through my hands, except through my eyes, except through my feet, my voice, my body. God says, I choose to partner with creation. That which I have created, it should do a couple of things to you. Number one, it should remind you how special you are. <laughs> How many has been raised to think that our lives are not particularly spectacular? You just kind of, oh, there's, you know, persons like you growing a tree every day. God is telling you the exact opposite. God is saying you are so special and significant that what I choose to do in the world, I do it through you. How then do we align ourselves with this idea that better is coming because God is active in our lives? I know your life may feel like the puzzle that you got started and now you're in the middle of putting it together and you got big holes in your puzzle. You're looking at the picture and you're looking at your puzzle and you're like, hmm, this don't look the way I thought it would look. Well, here are a few things that the text says that I think are going to be an encouragement to you and I. The first thing that I think the scripture lifts up is it says that your past should be your foundation to build on, not the house you live in. Our past should be a foundation 
for us to build on, not a house we live in. You and I have a history that if we were to depend on the ups and downs, the, the wins, the losses, the hurts, the pains, we may think we are disqualified from being God's hands and feet in the world. But the scripture makes it clear that everything you go through, child of God, it's your foundation. It's something for you to build on. It's not something for you to live in. It's something for you to build on. If you've ever bought a house, you will appreciate that the foundation is very important, but you don't live in the foundation. Hello, somebody. You don't live in the foundation. You live on top. You build that which is desirable, that which is beautiful, that which can hold the complexity of your life, you build that on top of a sturdy foundation. Guess what? Your life, your experiences, everything that you've gone through is not the house. Sometimes we live in the house of shame. We live in a house of abuse, of, 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 of offense. And I hear God speaking to us today that there is a series of experiences that you and I spend too much time living in when we're supposed to build on top of it. It is important to have a frame of reference in your journey towards your Destiny. The scripture says in verse three, who is left of you who saw the house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? You and I must always be a people who can have a sense of where we came from. So we can be clear about where and how God has brought us through. You that lack memory of God's goodness will be bound by the complexity and despair of your current situation. If you can't have a, a count, a recount of God brought us through this hard time, this hard situation, you will always start from scratch. Every time you go through, you'll be thinking, I'm starting from the beginning. But I want you to know, every time you have a loss, every time you have a success, every time you have something that is definable or definitive in your life, you ought to build on top of that as a launching pad to your next destination. I want you to be a people, a person who knows that, God, I got to keep moving forward. I can't get caught in the in the in the 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 current moment that causes me to to literally get sucked down to my lowest point or get high off of my greatest success. There's something particular about when you get too low or when you get too high, you can lose a, a, a sense of where you are rather than appreciate where you are going. And I want you to be clear, child of God, that you're going somewhere. You ought to pat yourself on the chest and say, I'm going somewhere. I'm going somewhere that there's a foundation that God is building. And God wants you, listen, to treat your past as a foundation. Treat your journey as a foundation. Those tears you had to shed, treat it as a foundation. Those transitions you've had to make, treat it as a foundation. The, the 18 years we've been doing ministry, we treat it as a foundation. Why? Because God is still building something in and through us. And I want you to appreciate that the way you use your history and your past is to give God space to redeem it. So it can be a launching pad for a future that is for your better. Somebody say, use it as a foundation. 
The second thing that I love about this passage, it says that literally in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth. Oh, uh, the second thing that you got to know today is that God wants to shake up your world. Oh, somebody holler, shake me up, God. I know not everybody said it because some of y'all like, I don't want God to shake me up. Amen. I, I'm cool just how I am. But listen, child of God, how many of you know that God can shake you in a way that'll cause you to feel brand new? In a little while, God says, I will shake the heavens and the earth. I'm going to shake the sea and the dry land. I'm going to shake the nations. God is describing all kinds of circumstances in here. That God is literally saying that how things are today, they cannot remain this way if you're going to take the next step. That there is a shaking that is necessary. There is something that God needs to test to, to, to help reveal to you what has a hold of you. How many know some of us got some things that are holding too fastly to us? And we won't let it go, so God usually has to shake it. Amen. And see, will it fall off of us with a little bit of shaking? Hello, somebody. And, and, and I have found that when God starts to shake, God will also help me be clear about what I need to hold on to. When you get shook up, how many know you can't hold on to everything? Amen. When you get shook up, you got to hold on to that which matters the most. Some of us are going through life and we're holding on to things that God is saying, I did not intend for you to hold that so close to your heart. So let me shake up some things and, and, and help you to, to throw off some excess weight so we can make space for the new. Woo, that God is trying to bring. I, I wonder, child of God, if you can imagine that, that God wants to shake you up so God can create divine openings in your life so you can literally get another opportunity to start again. Somebody say, shake me up, Lord. God sometimes uses the shaking in your life so you can gain new knowledge because some of us have allowed the old way of thinking to become too concretized in our life. Amen. But there's an earthquake God can bring that'll bring all of that stuff to the ground. Somebody holler, shake me up, Lord. God knows that sometimes a shaking will give you the impetus to actually move in a way you wouldn't move before. Because you realize, perhaps, that where I am today, I need not be here. I need to take a big leap. Anybody want to take a big leap and say, God, I don't want to stay in this place where I've been for so long. I'm here to tell you, sometimes, you know, God is, is gently kind of, you know, just trying to, you know, hey, Michael, you know, just take that step. And you're like, okay, God, five years later, you ain't moved. Yeah, my God is like, okay, Michael, you know, take that step. And you're still there. And so God will shake you. And you're like, yes, Lord. <laughs> Anybody ever had an experience where you needed a nice, real, divine interruption? Lord, I feel like preaching in here today. Amen. I what is the question then that I want you to ask as you go through your seasons of shaking what must go and what must stay who what must stay as God shakes you up and what must you let go of as God shakes you up? What are the opportunities for growth as God shakes you up? And what are the opportunities for healing as God shakes you up? And finally, what are the opportunities to see God's glory as God shakes you up? Uh, uh, this word glory in the Hebrew is uh, Ichabod. Uh, it is the presence of God that was always described when God literally made a, a interaction with human beings. Uh, it was God's way of describing that I am present in a way I've not been present before. Uh, how many know there's levels to God's presence? Uh, you know, it's kind of like, you know, 
uh, God is around me and I'm glad God's around. Uh, oh God, I'm, I'm glad you're here. Uh, I'm glad that you're with me always. Oh God, what a great promise. Uh, but then there are moments where you call out to God uh, because you need more of God's presence. Uh, you know, the kind of regular, I know God is here, is not enough to help you make it through this hellish situation. Uh, but I know God, I need you. And the level of God's presence immediately begins to heighten. Well, I'm here to tell you today that better is coming when God's glory shows up. Lord, can I preach for a few minutes today? Verse number nine in the message translation, it says that this temple is going to end up far better than it started out. God is saying you may have started with a good beginning, but the way I'm going to finish this thing will be more glorious than your beginning. Can you imagine that even though you may have started out with a lot of good energy, God is saying I'm going to cause you to end uh, with a more glorious finish, uh, which just means that it's going to get better, uh, that God is going to improve on your situation. Uh, you may have had to cry some nights, uh, but God says, I got a glorious finish in store. Uh, people may have had to walk out of your life, uh, but God says, I got a glorious finish awaiting you. Uh, you may have lost your job. But God says, I got a glorious finish for you. Your family may be on the rocks, but God is saying, I got a glorious finish for you. You may be struggling to make it through school. You may be struggling to make it through your employment. You may have just got home from jail. You may be struggling with your housing. You may be struggling in your mind. But God is saying, I got a glorious finish for you. If you could just hold out, don't throw in the towel and get ready for the glory of the Lord to swoop on in. I can mend your broken heart. I can mend your relationships with your children. I can give you peace in the midnight hour. I can help you recover your purpose because the glorious finish that God is bringing, it's better than your beginning. Do I have a witness who can look back and say, I had to go through hell, but I see heaven on the horizon. I had to go through struggle, but I see victory on the horizon. I had to go through pain, but healing, power, victory, anointing, it's within reach. Somebody shout hallelujah. And so child of God, I just want you to be ready. I want you to make some room because God said, when I show up, I'm bringing wholeness. When I show up, I'm bringing peace. When I show up, I'm bringing love. When I show up, I'm bringing power. When I show up, I'm bringing victory. I'm bringing elevation. I'm bringing favor. Show Show up, God. I need you to show up today. I want you to show up today. This is the day. This is the hour. Your greater shall be later. Because God has promised to show up. Shout hallelujah. stand with me everybody we're gonna pray I want you to lift your hands to the Lord and say God whatever you're doing in this season don't do it without me God if you're healing in this season don't do it without me if you're bringing better to my life don't do it without me 
because I want to be your hands and your legs. I want to be your feet. I want to be your eyes, God. I want to partner with you. So God, whatever you're doing, don't do it without me. Somebody say, don't do it without me, God. Come on, say it again. Don't do it without me, Lord. Don't do it without me, Lord. Come on, help us sing. Say, Lord, whatever you're doing in this season, don't do it without me. Don't do it without me. season. Don't do it without me. Don't do it. Tell the Lord, don't do it without me. Say it again, Lord, whatever say. of someone next to you God I'm holding the hand of someone who needs you God to remind them that their greater shall be later that though the promise may be delayed they can wait on it because you will always deliver you will always show up God, you're building a house that is not made with hands, but it is made by your favor and your glory. So as I grab the hand of the person next to me, I pray, God, give them healing in their body. Somebody say, heal them, Lord. Give them peace in their mind. Somebody say, give them peace, Lord. Give them vision in their mind. Give them wholeness. Give them holiness. Give them spiritual power. May they know, God, that no weapon that is formed against them will prosper. May they know, God, that you want to work through them. God, every assignment that they are living out, I pray, God, that your blessing would be unleashed on them. Bless their business. Bless their relationships. Bless their children. Bless their families. Bless their communities. We defeat the enemy today that will cause us to be overly preoccupied with our current circumstance that we forget that God, you're at work. You're at work in a way that is undeniable. So God, I squeeze power and joy and peace and hope into the hands of my loved one today. Give them what they need, God. So they know, God, that you are at work in them. In Jesus' name. Now lift those hands right where you're standing. It's me, O oh Lord. And I stand in the need of prayer. It is not my mother, it's not my father, it's my, not my sister, not my brother, but it's me, oh Lord, and I need you. I need you, God, to give me an overwhelming sense of your presence. I need you to remind me, God, that I am not forsaken. I need you to remind me, God, that no matter what they say on my job, in my community, in my family, I am precious and fearfully and wonderfully made. So God, I pray today as I lift my hands that I will receive a double portion of your spirit that is at work in me. Oh God, do a new thing. Do a healing thing. Do a delivering thing. And do it right now. Somebody say, I receive it, Lord. Say it again, I receive it, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Come on, hug two or three people and tell them your greater will be later. Come on, say, your greater will be later. <laughs>